Chapter 6 We warned you to keep away from here, creep, Malik yelled at Kerry. He took the football and heaved it. The ball bounced hard off Kerry's chest. He cried out, more in surprise than in pain. We're not bothering anyone, Kerry said, taking a step back. You're bothering me, Malik said. His red hair and freckled face usually made him look like a little boy, but now he was sneering, showing all of his teeth. His eyes narrowed menacingly, his big, freckled hands making and unmaking fists, and there was nothing cute or boyish about him. You're bothering me too, Bugner said, trying to sound as tough as Malik and almost pulling it off. Don't be a copycat, Josh called to him. Bugner raised a fist. You keep out of this, Goodwin, he spat on the ground. We don't have anything against you, except your choice of friends. Kerry looked around for an escape route. He figured the wisest move here was to run. These former teammates hadn't come running up for a chat. He realized at once that he was trapped, surrounded on three sides by the high metal fence. The only exit was across two basketball courts. He'd never make it. He looked up at the sun, white and pure in a cloudless blue sky, and he felt a strange surge of power. He made up his mind. He wasn't going to run from these guys. He suddenly felt as pure and strong as the white sun. He knew he was right. He knew what he had to do. He would stand and fight them. He looked down, the sun's glare still white in his eyes. Malik came at him first. Kerry heaved the basketball at Malik's head. Malik ducked, right into Kerry's left fist. Malik's jaw made a crunching sound as it made contact with Kerry's powerful fist. Fists of steel, Kerry yelled in a voice he'd never heard before. Malik gasped in surprise and began to choke. He staggered toward the fence. Kerry ran after him, spun him around, and smashed his right fist into the other side of Malik's face. Malik dropped to the asphalt, choking and gasping for air. Hey, he's got some punch, he heard Bugner say to O'Brien. It was a lucky punch, O'Brien yelled, lunging at Kerry. Kerry dodged away quickly, turned, and landed a slashing karate chop on the back of O'Brien's neck. O'Brien's eyes nearly popped out of his head as he slumped helpless to the ground. He's tough, he's tough, Brian muttered over and over. You ain't seen nothing yet, Kerry cried. He ran over to O'Brien scooped him up off the ground, and held him high over his head like a sack of flour. He felt another surge of power. His arms crackled with electricity. O'Brien felt light as a feather. With a cry of triumph, Kerry tossed O'Brien onto the attacking Bugner and Henderson. They both yelped in pain and astonishment as the heavy body fell on top of them, sending them sprawling backward to the ground. Nice toss, Ace, Josh called from the sidelines. We give! We give! Please, stop, pleaded Bugner and Henderson. Stop, stop it. Another voice, a female voice, called from the other end of the tennis courts. Bugner and Henderson struggled out from under O'Brien and scrambled to their feet. Groggily, O'Brien tried to sit up. Malik staggered to the fence and held himself up against it, still gasping in pain. Everyone turned to watch the girl running toward them, yelling, Stop, stop it right now. It was Sharon Spinner, Sal's girlfriend. She ran up to Kerry and put a hand on his shoulder. It took her a few seconds to catch her breath. What's going on? What are you doing? She asked. She didn't wait for an answer. Sal's fine. He just called me. He's going to be okay. That's great news, Kerry cried happily. He told me to tell everyone it was an accident, Sharon said, her hand still resting on Kerry's shoulder. It wasn't Kerry's fault. Sal said everyone has to know that. There was a moment of surprised silence while everyone let her words, Sal's words, sink in. I guess I owe you an apology, Sharon said, looking down at the ground. I guess we all do. She gave Kerry a quick, soft kiss on the cheek. Yeah, I guess we do, O'Brien said, climbing to his feet. He walked over and shook Kerry's hand. Sorry, Hart. No offense, man, Malik said, rubbing his broken jaw. Yeah, no offense, man, Bugner and Henderson echoed. Let's not talk about it anymore, Kerry said, feeling warm and happy. Let's let bygones be bygones, okay? He smiled. He looked up at the sun, white and pure. The pure white light flowed through him. Still smiling, he looked down. Sharon was gone, vanished into thin air. He blinked, blinked again. The four angry football players were coming toward him, ready to attack. What are you smiling about, you little puke? Malik demanded. He wasn't injured anymore. None of them were. There had been no fight. What a time to be daydreaming, Kerry thought. But what a fantastic daydream. The white glare of the sun still clouded his eyes, but he was back in the real world now. Sal's in the hospital, and you're smiling, Malik said bitterly. 
He raised a big fist and took a step toward Kerry. Now, wait a minute, Malik. Kerry bounced the basketball hard against the asphalt. Sal will tell you it was an accident. Why can't you get that through your thick head? Sal isn't here to tell us, is he hard, O'Brien said. He pulled up the sleeves of his sweatshirt as if preparing to fight. Let's pause for a few moments of nonviolence, Josh said. Kerry could see that he was looking for an escape route, too, and coming to the same unpleasant realization that Kerry had. The freshmen on the next court had broken up their game. They were all leaning against the far fence, watching in silence. O'Brien shoved Josh hard, then shoved him again. Take a walk, beak face. Josh looked as if he was going to say something, then thought better of it. He backed away. Listen, there are witnesses here, he said finally. You guys aren't going to get away with anything. You might as well... Get away with what? O'Brien demanded. You mean, get away with this? He reached his arm back as if cocking a rifle, then shot it forward and gave Kerry a powerful thrusting punch in the solar plexus. Kerry choked and dropped to his knees. What are you guys trying to prove? That you're Neanderthals? Josh cried, his voice rising a pitch or two. Leave him alone. Shut up, Goodwin, Bugner cried. He turned and pulled Kerry, who was still gasping for breath, to his feet. Then he swung a punch that just missed Kerry's right eye. Blood poured from the cut it opened on Kerry's cheek. O'Brien grabbed Kerry by the shoulders as if propping him up into position. Then he slugged him hard in the mouth. Kerry's lips split. His face was covered with blood. Hey, that's enough, Malik cried, looking nervously toward the freshman ball players, who were still leaning in silence against the far fence. It was just an accident, Hart. The four of them laughed heartily at this joke of Malik's. Hey, you hurt my hand with your face, O'Brien yelled angrily, holding his right fist tenderly in his left hand. He wheeled around and drove his left fist deep into Carrie's stomach. Kerry moaned and slumped to the ground, breathing noisily, blood pouring from his face. It was an accident, Bugner repeated. Just an accident. O'Brien pointed a threatening finger at Josh, who was standing unsteadily, white with fear by the fence. You better keep your big mouth shut, Goodwin. You never know when another accident might happen, do you? Josh was too upset to reply. He looked away. The four football players slapped each other's hands as if they had just scored a winning touchdown. Then they trotted off together across the court, grim-faced but victorious. Josh leaned against the fence, lowered his head, and had the dry heaves. It took a long time to get his stomach under control, and when he finally stopped heaving, he was too dizzy to walk. He took several deep breaths, felt a little better, and hurried over to help Kerry, who still lay choking on his own blood, his eyes closed on the hot, steaming asphalt. Chapter 7 He got to school early the next morning, before 7.30. There was no one waiting for him outside the building. He walked around to the side and looked up and down the parking lot. No one. So he went inside. His footsteps echoed off the tile walls in the empty corridor. There was a girl standing beside his locker. She was tall and had very light blonde hair. She was wearing a plain blue dress, sort of a smock. He walked up to her and tried to smile, but his swollen lips wouldn't cooperate. He saw that she had a ribbon in her hair, red and yellow hearts the kind of a ribbon a little girl would wear. Her eyes were pale blue, almost gray. They were translucent. They seemed to be painted on, like a doll's eyes. Everything about her was light and pale, except for her lips. Her mouth was wide, pulled up in a grin, and she wore dark purple lipstick, which looked even darker and more out of place against her powder-white skin. He thought she looked a little like Alice in Wonderland, except for those purple lips. Hi, are you Mandy? It was an effort to talk. Every word made his entire face hurt. Mandy? She looked at him as if he were a piece of spoiled fish. No, I'm Sarah Beth Hoskins. Who are you? Her dark lips formed a sneer. He stood in stunned silence for a long moment. Oh, sorry. Then she laughed, and he recognized the laugh. I couldn't keep a straight face, she said, putting a hand on his shoulder. She gave his shoulder a little squeeze and dropped her hand. Her hands were tiny, he saw, like a doll's hands. It's nice to meet you finally, Carrie. Her voice was softer and smaller than it had been on the phone. Yeah, he said, still feeling the squeeze of her hand on his shoulder. Such a strange thing to do, he thought. You look disgusting, she said, examining his face. I, uh, I fell out of bed this morning. Do you live on the edge of a cliff? She laughed. He tried to laugh, but it made his stomach and his side ache with pain, so he cut it short. Does it hurt? she asked, her voice filling with sympathy. 
No, not much, he lied. Well, it's killing me. Ha ha ha. Where did that loud, dirty laugh come from? Carrie wondered. Her voice was so soft, so kittenish. He decided that her mouth belonged on a different face, but he liked her sense of humor. Please, don't make me laugh, he said, holding his side. I'm sorry, she said quickly, biting her lower lip. I have a rotten sense of humor, I'm afraid. He started to protest. But I have some very good qualities, too, she added. Her purple mouth formed a sly smile. It was very sexy, especially on that pale, innocent face. Carrie tried to smile back, but it made the bruise on his cheek throb. He really was in bad shape. It was nearly impossible to drag himself out of bed, and for a few seconds he had considered staying home, lying around for a day to try to heal. But he couldn't stand her up again. No way. He had actually screamed when he tried to wash his face. The warm water burned like acid, but it was worth it. He was glad he had forced himself to come to school. He looked at Mandy, so pale, so paper pale in the dim corridor light, those flat blue eyes looking back at him. He decided she was beautiful, in an unusual sort of way. I want to apologize again for Saturday night, he said. Okay, go ahead. I apologize. Very eloquent, she said. Apology accepted. Now, how about my tour? This school is bigger than I thought. How many kids go here? I don't know. Well, I can see I'm going to learn a lot on this tour, she said, and she took his arm. Her little hand felt cold. Good. She must be nervous, too, Carrie told himself. Where shall we start, he asked, a little uncomfortable with her holding on to him. Whose homeroom are you in? Did they tell you? 302, she said. Hopewell. He's all right. He makes bad jokes about the morning announcements and laughs at his own jokes. But you don't have to listen. Here, I'll show you where 302 is. Then I'll show you the cafeteria and the library. A few early birds had begun to arrive. The silence of the halls was interrupted by the clanking of locker doors and the slam of books being dropped into them. Two girls Carrie didn't know walked by, giving them wide, open-mouthed stares. Carrie decided they must make quite a sight. This tall, blonde girl in the old-fashioned blue smock, and him with his head all red and puffed up like a salami. You just passed 302, she said, pulling on his arm. Oh, sorry. He shook his head as if trying to get his brain to work. I'm a little out of it this morning. Maybe we should just sit down somewhere, she suggested, like in the nurse's office. I'm okay, he said quickly. Here's the cafeteria. No one eats here if they can help it, but sometimes you don't have a choice. Gee, it sure is green, isn't it? She said, squeezing his arm. I don't think I've ever seen a room that green. It looks even greener after lunch, he said. He smiled. It didn't hurt that much. Maybe his face was loosening up, or maybe she had a healing touch. Where do you go before here? he asked. The question seems to surprise her. Her eyes grew wide for a second, and her mouth formed a bright O. Oh. I went to a private school. A very private school, she said, turning to watch a girl with pink hair and a fake leopard skin jacket who walked by. Where? What? She seems distracted. Where was the school? In a very private place, of course, she laughed. You wouldn't know it. Where are you from? A lot of places. I've moved around a lot. Now I'm from here. Well, I can see I'm going to learn a lot on this tour, he said. She laughed and pulled herself closer to him, her dress rubbing against his side. I like to be mysterious, she said in a mysterious, movie spy sort of voice. You're very good at it, he told her. Compliments will get you everywhere, she said, pulling away from him and letting go of his arm. Where are we? That's the vice principal's office, he said. What kind of vice does he offer? She smiled at him, leaned close, and rested her head on his shoulder for just a second. It was a simple, innocent-seeming gesture, but it drove Carrie absolutely wild. How will I ever be able to think about anything else but her, he asked himself, realizing that he was being captivated, that she had managed to completely win him over with just a few smiles and touches. Was she doing it deliberately? Carrie decided she was clinging to him so much because she was insecure. It wasn't easy to start at a new school, especially if you were used to a place that was very different, and Revere was about as far from an exclusive private school as you could get. Only about 20% of the kids who graduated went on to college, and most of them went to the two-year colleges nearby. And obviously she had come from a place where kids dressed a lot more formally. You were in a fight, weren't you? She said suddenly, almost accusingly. Yeah, I was almost in it, Carrie said, the memory of it rushing back, the crush of fists against his face, the gasping for air. He let out a small sigh. Do you often do such macho things? She asked provocatively. 
Every day, he said sarcastically, I like a good fight before breakfast. It wakes me up in the morning. You're not very good at sarcasm, she said, her dark lips frowning. I'm starting to get better at it, he said. He realized he was trying to be as mysterious as she was. Look, Mandy, I really don't want to talk about it. There was a misunderstanding, and some guys here think I did something that I didn't do. So they beat the crap out of me. It wasn't too macho or interesting or anything. I'll tell you the truth. It was the first fight I was ever in in my whole life, and I just hope that— Is that the gym? she interrupted. He realized that she hadn't heard a word he'd been saying. Is there a boy's gym and a girl's gym? He scowled. He was hurt that she had gotten so easily distracted. What had happened to him was pretty dramatic after all. She didn't have to smother him with sympathy. They had just met, but she could at least pretend to listen. No, there's only one gym, he told her. Everything is co-ed here. I like that, she purred, sounding sexy again. There was a bond issue last year to add a swimming pool, but it was voted down. Everything having to do with Revere gets voted down. He opened the door, and the familiar gym smell greeted them both. She looked at her watch. He couldn't figure out if she was bored or just nervous about her first day. He decided she was nervous. It's almost time for the bell, he said. You can walk me back to my locker. It's near your homeroom. She gave him a warm smile that spread across her face. They made their way through the crowded, noisy hallway that a few minutes before had been theirs alone. Hey, Hart, where'd you get the fat lip? He didn't see who was calling to him. Is that your face, or did you forget to take out the garbage? You've got nice friends, Mandy said, yelling above the roar of shouting voices and slamming lockers. Everyone's a comedian, Carrie muttered. What? Never mind. They turned a corner and stopped next to his locker. Your room is right over there, remember? He said. It was so nice of you to come in early and show me everything, she said, lowering her eyes. Then she grabbed his hand and shook it, her cold little hand grasping his tightly, almost too tightly. I, uh, wanted to meet you, he said. Listen, there's a, uh, dance here Sunday night, some sort of autumn dance or something. I'd love to, she said. She gave him the warm, wide smile again. I'll be your blind date one week late. Good deal, he said. The hall was nearly empty. Most kids were in their homerooms. Do you think you'll be able to find a house this time? She asked. I'll tell you what. I'll meet you here at school. She didn't seem to want to leave. The thought that she wanted to stay with him made Carrie smile. Good idea, he said. Well, I guess I'll see you, she said slowly. She's beautiful, he thought. She's unusually beautiful. He turned and opened his locker. Oh, no, she screamed. I don't believe it, he cried. They both stared at the inside of his narrow locker, at the locker walls, at his notebooks and his textbooks, all smeared, all covered with blood. She grabbed his arm and squeezed it tightly. She stared at him, her blue eyes filled with confusion and concern. Carrie, she said in a trembling voice, is someone out to get you? Chapter 8 The blood turned out to be red paint, but that didn't make Carrie's day any easier. First, he had to be excused from homeroom to go to the principal's office to see about getting new textbooks. The principal, Mr. Conquest, was normally a mild-mannered, almost wimpy sort of guy who always wore ragged gray cardigans several sizes too large and walked around with an unlit pipe in his mouth. But he became enraged when Carrie told him why he needed the new texts. This is not a practical joke, Conquest said, slamming the bowl of his pipe against his desktop dramatically. This is an act of vandalism. I cannot tolerate wanton acts of violence on school property. Carrie sat uncomfortably across from the principal's desk, his face aching and swollen, red paint on his hands. Yeah, I agree, he said quietly, but when Conquest demanded to know if Carrie had any idea who might have poured the paint into his locker, Carrie just shrugged. What happened to your face? Conquest asked, leaning closer. That looks nasty. It feels nasty, Carrie muttered. I was in a fight. You seem to be having your share of problems, Conquest said, still staring into Carrie's face. You sure you don't want to talk to somebody? It helps, you know. He wasn't a bad guy, Carrie decided. He actually seems like a human, something no one expects in a school administrator. I don't think it would help, Carrie said. It's something I have to work out on my own. Conquest stared at him in silence. He picked up the pipe and slapped it gently against his open palm. Maybe we should have an assembly to talk about the vandalism that was done, he said thoughtfully. No! Carrie jumps to his feet. Conquest pulled back, startled, and almost toppled over backward. Please, Carrie said. It would only cause more trouble. I'll take care of it. Really, I will. 
You seem to be doing a fabulous job so far, the principal said, regaining his balance and his composure. This has to do with that accident on the football field last week, doesn't it? Kerry nodded. The Murdoch boy came out of his coma, Conquest said, sucking on the pipe stem. Oh, that's great, Kerry cried. It was just shock trauma. It happens. He'll be okay now. Except for the leg, of course. Great, Kerry repeated. It was the first good news he'd heard in a while. They're not allowing him to have visitors for a few days, but that's understandable. Listen, Carrie, we'll get you a new set of texts, and we won't do anything about the malicious attack on your property. Thanks, Mr. Conquest. I... But if anything else happens, I want you to come tell me about it. Is that a deal? Okay, Carrie said, getting up. What else could he say? For an instant, he thought of telling Conquest about the threatening phone calls, but he quickly decided to leave well enough alone. What could the principal do about it anyway? Call an assembly? That would really do a whole lot of good. He thanked Mr. Conquest again and backed out of the office. When he reached the hall, the bell for class change rang right above his head, practically startling him out of his shoes. He turned and began walking toward his first class, and bumped right into Sharon Spinner. Ouch! she yelled. She was overreacting. He hadn't really bumped her that hard. Jerk! Are you going to break my leg now? Sharon, I want to talk to you. Well. That makes my heart go pity, Pat. Did you hear that Sal is awake? I just heard, Carrie said, hurrying to keep up with her as she walked as quickly as she could down the hall. I'm so glad. Have you talked to him yet? Not yet, she called back to him. They won't let him take any calls or see anyone until tomorrow. Sharon, I've got to talk to you about the phone calls. She didn't stop walking. But Carrie took it as a good sign that she was talking to him at all. She still seemed angry, but her anger appeared to be in control. What phone calls? I think you know what I'm talking about. She spun around angrily, bumping into two other kids who happened to be walking at her side. I don't have the time or interest for any stupid mysteries, Hart, she said, clenching her teeth and narrowing her eyes. Sharon, the calls. The bell rang. Leave me alone, she yelled, turning and running toward room 234 at the end of the nearly empty hall. Just leave me alone. You've done enough. She disappeared into the classroom. Miss McCurdy poked her gray head out of the door and started carrying. You're late, young man. Where's your class? He couldn't remember. It was one more great moment to add to what was becoming a monumentally lousy day. He thought about Mandy through all of his classes and through his two study halls. It kept his mind off everything else. A lot of kids weren't talking to him because of what they thought he had deliberately done to Sal's leg. They made a big point of snubbing him so that he'd know their feelings. The kids who were talking to him only wanted to talk about how awful he looked. This wasn't exactly a subject he wanted to pursue. He looked for Mandy after his last class, but he couldn't find her anywhere. He took the bus home, riding up to the hills, lost in thought, feeling sorry for himself, feeling very alone. Watching Sean lie on the couch, watching reruns of old sitcoms didn't make him feel any less alone. Sean could see that Carrie was feeling pretty low. He offered to switch off the sitcoms and put on MTV. A very generous offer for Sean but Carrie declined and went up to his room. After a dinner of microwaved McDonald's hamburgers, Carrie went back up to his room. He decided to go to bed early. Sleep was the only escape from the aches and pains of his battered and bruised body. It was only eight o'clock, but he fell asleep quickly. He had a vivid dream, a dream he had had before. He saw a bright blue sky streaked with ribbons of white puffy clouds. The sky was reflected on the smooth waters of a gently flowing river. He and Donald were in a canoe on the river, Donald smiling lazily, rowing casually, his paddles moving slowly back and forth. Carrie, in contrast, was rowing frantically, desperately trying to keep up with Donald, even though they were in the same canoe. Their parents, both of them, stood together on the green shore, their arms around each other, yelling encouragement to the two brothers in the canoe, waving them on. Carrie felt wonderful. The sun beat down, making him warm and comfortable all over. The water splashed and sparkled as he and Donald moved the bright red paddles. Donald gave him a big grin. You're doing it, kid. You're really doing it, he said, crinkling his eyes in that happy way. Donald was the only one in the family who could crinkle his eyes. Faster, faster, Carrie paddled, urged on by Donald's words. Suddenly, he had a horrible realization. He knew without seeing it that they were headed toward a sheer drop, a steep, raging waterfall. He looked across the canoe at Donald. Donald grinned and continued paddling lazily, lying back and enjoying the hot, hot sun. Donald didn't know about the waterfall. You're doing wonderfully, boys. Their mother, her black hair fluttering freely in the rippling river breezes, called. 
waving to them from the shore. Kerry realized that he was the only one who knew about the waterfall. He knew he should tell Donald, but he kept paddling furiously. The river flowed gently, but Kerry knew that they were only a few yards away from the drop, only a few seconds away from being hurtled over the steep waterfall. Great, great boys, I'm so proud, their father yelled, tipping his police cap in an exaggerated salute. Kerry kept paddling. He knew he should tell Donald. Now. He struggled with himself. He wasn't going to tell. Yes, he was. No. Why doesn't Donald know about the waterfall, too? Why am I the only one? Closer. Closer. The blue waters began to swirl and bubble up, white and frothy. The phone woke him up from the dream. What would he have told Donald if the dream had continued? Would he have told Donald if the dream had continued? Would he have stopped paddling so furiously toward certain disaster? He shook himself alert and stared at the clock. It was one in the morning. How long had the phone been ringing? One o'clock in the morning. Another call. When would she stop? What was the point of this? He grabbed the receiver. He was going to keep her on the line this time. He was going to get through to her. Enough was enough. Now listen, he screamed into the receiver, startled by his own anger and frustration. Hey, man, did you meet her? What was she like? Josh? Yeah, it's Josh. How quickly they forget. I was only out of school for one day, Carrie. Sorry, I, uh, was asleep. Dreaming, I guess. Since when do you have to be asleep to be dreaming? Carrie's heart was still racing. He took a deep breath. Where were you today? Upset stomach. Right, I believe it, Carrie said sarcastically. You'd have an upset stomach, too, if you had to look at you, Josh said. You feel any better? Aces, Carrie said. Anyone decided to play handball with your face today? No, they poured red paint in my locker instead, Carrie said. Cool. Josh was silent for a moment. Then he said, At least you don't have to worry like the rest of us about being popular. You know everyone hates your guts. Very funny, Carrie said, yawning. Can I go back to sleep now that you've cheered me up? No, Josh insisted. What about Mandy? I didn't call to talk about you. Did you meet her? Is she as sexy in person as she is on the phone? Or is she a bow-wow with a great voice? I met her, Carrie said. He had been thinking about Mandy all day and all evening. But now it was hard to think of anything to say about her. She's real nice. Uh-oh, Josh said. Nice, huh? She's sexy, Carrie admitted. She's real different. Is she hot for your bod, Carrie? Come on, man, you can tell me. Well, she's, uh, what can I say? I know, I know, you're saving yourself for your wedding night. Hey, you've been real informative, Carrie. I should have dialed that city service number. At least I would have gotten the time and the temperature. Give me a break, Josh. I was asleep, and my head is throbbing. Hey, that's right, Josh said. You must have made some impression on Mandy with a face that looks like a boiled cabbage. You really know how to hurt a guy, Carrie said wearily. Did you hear? Sal woke up. He came out of his coma. When do you want to come out of yours? What? What did you say? Hey, I'm sorry. It was a joke, Carrie. It wasn't a heavy comment or anything. That's great about Sal. Really. You're sure a little edgy tonight, aren't you? Edgy? I don't know why I should be edgy, Carrie said. I get beaten up. I get threatening phone calls every night. Someone fills my locker with paint. Don't forget that everyone in school hates your guts, Josh added. Right, thanks. You're real helpful. They both laughed. Okay, Josh said suddenly. That was it. I just wanted to hear if you could still laugh. Good night. And he hung up. Carrie sat in the dark, holding the receiver tightly in his hand. I've got weird friends, he said aloud. He climbed back into bed, his side aching, his face throbbing. He remembered his dream. Closing his eyes, he tried to bring it back. I wonder if Donald and I go over the rapids, he thought, frowning. He had had the dream before, several times that he remembered. Each time he woke up in a panic, still paddling desperately just a few yards from disaster. He never saw the outcome. Maybe there wasn't one. It took a long time to get back to sleep. He thought about Mandy. She seemed so distant in a way, even when she was holding on to him. He liked the way she touched him, the way she took his arm, even though they had just met. She seemed open, available, hungry. He probably could make it with her. Thinking about that excited him and kept him even farther from sleep. What was it about her that was so different from the other girls at Revere? Well, it was the blue smock for one thing. It was so old-fashioned, so private school, so out of it. There wasn't anything trendy about Mandy, he realized. Not her hair, not her clothes. She didn't carry her books in a backpack that had, Hey, wait a minute. She didn't carry anything. 
He pictured her standing there by his locker when he arrived at school. Yes, she wasn't carrying anything at all, not even a pocketbook. He wanted to think about this more, to figure out what else was different about her. But he drifted off to sleep, a heavy, dreamless sleep, all black and silent and empty. When he came down the stairs the next morning, leaning against the banister because of the ache in his side, he was surprised to find his father waiting for him. He had his uniform on, but his tie was missing, and the collar was unbuttoned and open. His eyes were red-rimmed and circled with thick black rings. His lower lip trembled as he tried to greet Carrie. He put his arm around Carrie's shoulder and led him toward the living room couch. Uh-oh, Carrie thought. Something's up. He was right. I got some news this morning, his father said. His throat was fogged, but he didn't bother to clear it. News? Carrie asked, feeling his stomach tighten. Yeah, I, uh, got a call. Early. I've been waiting for you to wake up. He kept his arm around Carrie's shoulder. Carrie felt as if his father was leaning on him for support, using Carrie to stay on his feet. He had never leaned on Carrie before. What? What is it, Dad? It's your brother Donald, Lieutenant Hart said. He's escaped. 